This castle had a very huge tower. It was built in 18th century and originally this tower was built to have a nice view to the seaside at around 100 miles away. But then I called it the sex tower because of the parties. Mm, oh. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome back to your favourite kinky podcast, Spank You Next, with your host from Fetish.com, Anna and Gregor. Hey, it's episode two already of season two. I'm really excited to be back. Me too. Let's tell the audience what they can expect. This is the podcast where we sit down with a sex positive guest or someone in the BDSM scene or our own community on Fetish.com to talk all things BDSM, Fetish and Kink. Yeah, and usually it's kind of Anna, me in the studio together, and then we Skype or Zoom with somebody who's kind of all around the world. But this episode, we're actually not together, Anna. Tell people where you are. It's sad. Um, we're in the remote studio today because I went to a festival of two weeks, which is a terrible idea at 31 years of age. I'm dying and I got very sick. Um, thought it might be COVID, but it's actually not. But I don't want to infect people because you get cancelled now for going to offices with gods. And fair enough. Oh yeah, two weekends of festival, it's really crazy. It's absolutely wild. I don't, know. I don't think I'll ever do it again. But what was nice with this episode, our guest was actually in the studios with us when we recorded the interview, because we've been doing this through COVID. Most of our interviewees are remote, and I think it is different being together. So I'm excited to bring you the first episode, I think, where we're all in the room together. Um, let's, <laughs> so. let's introduce our guest for this week, Matera Peng. Yeah, Matera Pang is our friend and uh, colleague. So as you know, we work for Fetish.com and the Fat app, this kinky online platform and community. And Matera works for Kaufmich.com, which is an online escort service. Yeah, it's a platform where sex workers can advertise their services and clients can also buy services, but they get rated, it keeps sex workers safe, it makes the transaction much more reliable and a steady stream of income coming in for the sex workers. It's a brand that is a kind of sister brand to Fetch.com under this umbrella company idea-wise that we all work for. That might be a bit boring, but just to give some background. Yeah, so if you're based in Germany, you might as well just check it out. It's kaufmich.com and you will see it's really more like a a social network for escorts and clients. We're really hoping that it will be available in places like the UK and the US. But as we know, if you're a sex worker in America with the Zesta Foster Bill, it's incredibly difficult to be a sex worker online now. It's made it a lot more dangerous. And in the UK, it is decriminalized, but you're not allowed to sell your sexual services. So in the meantime, if you're in Germany, check it out. But we're hoping that it will come to other countries too. Mm, and these different laws Anna just mentioned are one of the topics we'll be talking about today. Because as it is with so many minorities, sex workers are usually excluded from conversations about their working rights. And Matira has been an activist for many years and she tells us all about how she got into sex work and the ongoing fight of improving sex workers' rights. Absolutely. And she really does recognize her own privilege being someone that chose sex work, who is white, who is educated and that she can be out and proud. And there's many that can't because they are working to put food on the table or not suffer from society and the stigmatization of sex work. So we get into all of this in the episode and more. Yeah, it was really interesting also to hear from her about the support, but also the competition within the sex workers community. And Matera actually, she kind of put all of this experience of hers into two books she has written. And now she's came to the podcast to talk with us about her life, her experience, and also one funny little story how for some time she lived in a, um, in a castle in the UK, and she called it her sex tower. She loved the sex tower until it got recaptured by the National Trust or something in this very quaint village. And of course, the final thing will, will be the thread through all the conversations is the worst thing in the world, the patriarchy. Oh my God, yeah, you know, it's one on, <laughs> it's one of Anne and my favorite topics. And I'm just going through a breakup and I see patriarchic structures and ideas 
all through it. Just yesterday I was listening to this Mamma Mia movie soundtrack and there's this one song by the wonderful Meryl Streep where she sings about how she's left without confidence after breakup. And I thought, why why is this? I mean, yes, it's sad, but what, what does it have to do with your confidence? And then I thought, it's man who it's wrote men. this song. You know, it's man who wrote this song. And from a man's perspective, the worst thing that can happen to a woman is losing a man. Exactly. So, it's even called, that, that one's the winner takes it all, right? Yeah. Uh, the God. men always win. Yeah. There is just a, a horrible inequality out there. Absolutely. Um, and there's nowhere more evident than in sex work. Okay. I'm really excited about this interview. So what do you say? Let's just bring her in here. Yes. Hello, Matira Pang. You are a former sex worker, activist, researcher, and now also a writer. Welcome to Spanky Next. Thank you very much. So tell us a little bit, how did you start out? How did you get into sex work? When I was younger, I was teaching and lecturing at the university and wrote my PhD studies. And uh, at the end, after four years, the German uh, scientific community decided that my PhD thesis was not compliant with uh, uh, official rules because I, uh, yeah, I criticized neoliberal politics. And this was the end of my uh, academic career. And then I started to do sex work because I'm an independent thinker and sex work and some other jobs in the informal industry are a job where there is not uh, only flexibility, but uh, there is a lot of freedom. So I decided to go into the underground and uh, start my sex worker career. <laughs> and where did you start it? Was it in Germany? Yes, I started in Brussels first in Germany. But after two years, I became an independent escort And I traveled around the world and later on I settled down in the UK, in Britain, and I worked from there for, for about six years. I read in one of your books that you have always been out and open about being a sex worker. Why was that important for you? And why can other people not be open about it? Yeah, usually you must be in a very privileged uh, position to come out because about uh, sex worker rights needs also a face, a turn up in public and not hidden away from the crowd. And the majority of sex workers prefer to stay anonymous because you have a lot of disadvantages, of course, if it comes out that you are a prostitute, a so-called sex, sex worker. worker. I prefer the term sex worker because prostitute is a very stigmatized term. So the majority has no chance to get out. Do you think this is changing now with the internet? When you think of OnlyFans, it's online, the content stays there. A lot of people are very open about their sexuality on Twitter. Yeah, usually sex workers, also porn performers, work with an alias, not with a real name. And so, and so far they can hide their identity in a way. I think there are two different lifestyles you cannot mix up in real time. So majority prefer to stay hidden from from the public so you have an, a sex worker identity or porn performer identity that's it yeah and also with the internet once you are online the, those images can be used anywhere the videos can be found by anyone so that's actually changed it in another way that it takes on higher risk if you want to stay um hidden or you want to keep private it's much harder to be on the internet yes that's true Did your friends and family also know? Yes, I had uh, to tell my family because I was speaking in public also on television and gave interviews as a sex worker rights activist and sex worker. So um, I informed my family early enough that they became no surprise or get noticed by other people, third people who tell them or blackmail me or my family. So, yeah. How did they react? Yeah, they were not very happy about it because mm. they said that I waste my talents, mm. Mm. also my academic talents when I selling my so-called body. That's, that's what the people or the public think. But for me, it was a clever lifestyle to finance my political work. So mm. I never stopped doing political work and sex work was a good opportunity 
Yeah, so that I could finance and survive. That was the main issue. So when you face this repression academically, you found sex work more liberating in many ways than going through this system that wouldn't allow you to express yourself freely. Absolutely. Because I find that interesting because so many people think, oh, you'd only become a sex worker because you have to. And obviously that is a lot of people's story that people don't choose the life. But in what ways can it be empowering to choose a life in the underground, as you said? Yeah, in my way, because I was stigmatized in the scientific community and it was uh, the best opportunity for me to survive. But many other uh, sex workers have very different experiences and very different backgrounds and different reasons why we start doing sex work. When it comes to sex work, I think kind of uh, in the general public, a lot of people are really for it, but others are really against it. And then there comes always this question of forced sex work or forced prostitution. Can you say something about this? Yes, there is a long tradition over, not the centuries, yeah, almost 100 years with the white slavery movement in the United States, but this movement of, of uh, so-called abolitionists who want to prohibit sex work and prostitution are still very popular and survived. <laughs> there is always a discussion and the public opinion is very split because there is still exploitation But the discussions circle around themselves. Since 20 years I observed this discussion, it's circling around itself and there is no solution and that's why I start writing all my experience down in a book. That's the thing. I read once that it's the oldest profession in the world. Yeah, maybe together with a taxi driver. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, sex work survived since 2,500 years and it was always a classist hierarchy of sex work or of the whole from uh, bottom to the top mm -hmm. and nowadays it's the same you have exploited people and also people who struggle for survival from people who are coming not from a privileged background from marginalized communities and then you have the middle class uh, sex work and also the high class and bdsm style when you charge 250 euro or an hour for example and these different um, classes and sex work have different privileges or no privileges in street-based sex work you cannot compare with high-class sex work right. but there's also sex trafficking happened to high-class escorts not to all of course but to some it does happen yeah it does happen so the reality is gray and not black and white so if you try to explore and found a good way to make a sex worker lives more safe and healthy you must dive into the complex reality and then you will find out that many sex workers are not happy hookers they are unhappy hookers they just do it to survive or people from the global south who are working in the rich north of our capitalist system they find it a good way to survive and also to finance the families and this is for many migrant sex workers the most important reason to go into sex work because you can much more money than in care work for example what's usually related to female work then it's not only about their own lives it's also about their family lives they make it for money and i, I never met a sex worker in my whole life who make it not for money but just for their joy or something yeah so it's always money Yeah, the, the, the original reason, yes, it's money, but so-called privileged workers also, some of them say they are very happy hookers, for them it's a perfect lifestyle as it was for me, but not at the early beginning because I also met uh, some violent experiences yeah, with clients. So. so as you learn, I guess you can take the clients you want and if you're more privileged, you can have only a few sessions a day rather than be out on the street, right, and putting your life at risk. But like yeah. you say, there are so many different types of ways that sex work can look yeah. but it's very hard to talk about sex workers as a general term yeah a privilege means for me access to knowledge and information but my background from university it was not a protection against violence at the end mm. if you start doing sex work there is no education for that you have no access to knowledge to whore knowledge I would say, and it's like you are jumping in the cold water and you find the best ways how to work safely. And um, so I'm very interested in professionalization from the early beginning. Which also means legalization. 
Right. Yeah, uh, dec the full decriminalization yeah. is a difference to legalization totally. as in Germany. But this is uh, the legal foundation because if you're working in a criminalized surrounding, you um, have more experience with violence and exploitation. And if you work in a more legal or decriminalized surrounding as in New Zealand or Germany, it's not so bad as, for example, in the United States where it's mostly uh, prohibited. Yeah, because if you do experience violence, you're less likely to go to the police because of stigma and violence against you there. Yes. And you can't lean on a legitimate, and I say that with air quotes, community to help you vet dangerous clients, etc. Yes, exactly. And uh, in the United States, I have been there. I traveled there several times and I spoke with many sex worker rights activists. Some of them have been in prison and have been radicalized in sex worker rights while uh, staying in prison. And uh, they always told me, you cannot go to police if you experience violence. In opposite, sometimes there are some police who try to exploit you or grab your money and also enforce you to do, give a blowjob or something or try to blackmail you. So mm. uh, sex workers have no trust to police in general. And, and also it depends from which countries they come from. Uh, many sex workers, migrant sex workers who are used to work in Western Europe and in Germany who came from East Europe. Yeah. They made really bad experience with police. So and there's also, a racial element. Yeah, that. and corruption. Mm. And this is also a very um, basic reason why they stay away from police and have no trust. And they cannot go and take legal action. Yeah. yeah, you said in, in Germany, sex work is mainly decriminalized, but I guess there are still things that can be done. So how is the situation in Germany for sex workers and what could still be done to improve that? Yeah, sex work is not a crime anymore. And so far it is decriminalized, but there are some exceptions. For example, there are federal regulations in some communities, you are not allowed to work as a sex worker, for example, in villages or um, towns with under 35,000 inhabitants. It's, Why? Yeah, it has to do with the <laughs> stigma that sex work or so-called prostitution is a hassle and it's, um, it's not a good house. I don't know, say in English... Uh, sittenwidrig. Um, oh, so it's, it's, it's kind of, it's not moral. Yeah, yeah. it's against the moral. So, it's more conservative yes. areas. Yeah. Conservative like I think, areas, exactly. I think there's also this stigma that sex work also goes together with crime, drugs, yes. alcohol, Gags, sexual yeah. transmitted diseases. You know? Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yes. And uh, there are also zoning areas, still zoning areas in Germany. What's that? Uh, zoning areas are restricted areas where sex workers cannot do sex work. For example, the, the red light area in Frankfurt, there is a zoning area and you can work indoor but not outdoor. So oh. it's uh, very different from city to city. Uh, and some zoning regulations say you can work indoor, in others you can work in the streets, but in others not. It's very difficult and many sex workers don't know all the different regulations and then sometimes they are going into a trap. For example, if they do an uh, out call at a hotel in Munich in the Bavaria, then they are working inside of the uh, zone and this is prohibited. And sometimes the police <laughs> pretend to be uh, clients. Oh, wow. and hire them uh, for and date them and then if the sex worker comes to the hotel uh, they are trapped and then they they're uh, arrested yes yeah, not arrested because no. it's a ordnungswidrigkeit it's ordnungsrecht it's not a crime it's they have to pay a fine yeah. oh, yeah. and if they are not able to pay fines then people can get into prison and so far it's not fully uh, decriminalized right I think it's interesting because I think Germany has some of the most liberal sex work laws, at least in the Western world. And if I look at the US, the Sesta Foster Bill, right, that is putting sex trafficking in the same bracket as uh, sex work. And the UK where it's slightly decriminalized in that you won't be arrested if you do it in certain ways, but you can't advertise your services, you can't work in groups, which makes it a lot less safe. So you're forced into a black market. So... Even though Germany has the most liberal laws, it's still not fully there yet. Yes. And the worst thing what happened to the sex worker community in Germany is 
with the new so-called prostitution protection law that came into effect in 2017, sex workers must be registered as so-called prostitutes and have to wear a hookah pass, a passport, a kind of passport, always. And uh, be because if... Uh, wow. So it's if, not just a working permit or whatever it is. It's that you have to say that you're a sex worker. It's clear a sex worker a passport and you have to have it with you. And uh, sometimes if there is police control, they check if you are registered or not. And if you are not registered, you work illegally. And there are still people who are not registered and they're working what, in an illegal way. What benefits do sex workers have from being registered? Is there any benefit to it? I don't think so. There is no benefit from that. It's very um, difficult because, as in the UK, 70% of all sex workers are also mothers. They have families or they have partners. And maybe the ch one child or the partner goes to the uh, hand uh, luggage and then yeah. fi they find the hookah passport. And usually they hide this work from the family and friends. And then if the family find out what they're really doing to make their income then they have a big problem. So it's also a very risky thing. But the, the thing was, it, a registration has a very, in German history a really bad tradition because at the Nazi times, and it's not only 75 years ago, but uh, the registration was yeah. also... Um, yeah, it, it reminded the, me a bit um, of the yellow stars the Jewish community had to wear under the Nazi regime. Yeah, and also sex workers were also thrown in uh, concentration camps and so on. They've often been the most marginalized in society just throughout history. Yeah, I think uh, they are still the most marginalized group yeah. in the world, I would say. Even though a lot of the men are happy to pay for it, they don't want to be seen associated with it, right? Because uh, it's immoral in the eyes of society. Yes, and also in the eyes of many clients. Yeah. So there is a lot of hypocrisy. The whole... I can say the whole uh, society profits from sex workers, uh, not only clients, also business people who run uh, brothels, but also the media who make scandalized coverage. There are lots of people in the so-called rescue industry who pretend to help sex workers and support sex workers and make their career on the backs of sex workers. So a lot of people profit from sex workers. And that's also the reason why they mistrust journalism and scientists and all these people who make a career from researching sex work. And um, yeah. they treat them like case studies rather than yeah. people. Yes, usually, um, yeah. Um, they have um, easily more access to sex workers in the streets because they are more approachable than the majority of sex workers who are working indoor. And usually, as a scientist, you have no access to this industry. Mm. Mm. So say, you say a lot of people are making money off sex work just because uh, sex work is so marginalized, because it's really uh, still <laughs> covered with shame. And then the very sex workers, they only make a, a really a split amount of all of that money. Yes, that's yeah. true. Well, just look at OnlyFans. I mean, and Pornhub. Pornhub is, uh, I know it's not the same, porn and sex work, but, uh, well, it can be. Yeah. But um, Pornhub is the eighth most visited website in the world. And OnlyFans now is going public on the stock market because it's so successful on the back of sex workers. But there's still so much disgust thrown towards sex workers. And what do you think that's about? Is it some internal shame we all have going on? Mm, look, um, not we. I workers, don't mean me. I mean all you out there. Sex workers can make a lot of money, and it's um, um, of course the share for sex work and sex workers must be much more than the share of the business owners. For example, OnlyFans they charge only twenty percent, and this is oh, yes. quite fair, I yeah. think. But in other cases, sex workers have to pay fifty uh, percent of their income not to the taxman but to the landlord when they uh, rent out a room or something. So it depends where you work. And um, yeah, not all sex workers make a lot of easy money. The reality is most of them struggle to survive and they hope that they have at the end of the month enough money to pay their rent and their insurance or to pay their family and their, to support their family and children. So this is the reality. Now you, if you... Um, 
under analyze sex work you have to think about poverty and social inequality and also inequality between genders and uh, it's a kind of yeah uh, mostly people um from marginalized community and who have because of their limited knowledge or education or access to other jobs they find a good option to survive and to find a financial independence in sex work and i think this is why sex work is very attractive for for many many people but the thing is to balance the money transfer i always say is balancing the gender inequality in a way and exactly. in this global patrimonial world you know absolutely I'm also keen to hear about your experience in the UK. Um, you know, compared to Germany, but also what was your experience being a sex worker in a different country like the UK? Yes, when I was starting, I found out there was a, a very strong competition in the escort industry in London, for example. So uh, maybe you have one or two clients a day and it's not so much if you were hanging around the whole day and waiting for clients. So I found out that it's much more effective if I work as a party girl and join sex parties okay. from time to time. And then I fly in to the UK, join some sex parties and fly back to Berlin. I was always traveling and between different countries. Were they generally private parties or in clubs or was it? No, private, pa so-called private parties. Yes, no. we hired uh, private uh, service apartments, very beautiful and sometimes luxury flats. In the best areas of London, like Kensington mm. and other areas, Chelsea and so on. And then we had three parties a day, always yeah, two hours each. And then we had a yeah, special offer for businessmen who came in lunchtime wow. uh, oh, to wow. the party. We Quickie. were always so three, four women. And then also four or five clients turned up to make a party. And they had also, we offered food and uh, everything so that they Drinks. feel very um, comfortable taken care of what year was this around what what era was this 2000s 90s oh it was uh, 2005 so, when I started partying yeah. and later on I took this concept because it works very well and then I also organized my own uh, sex parties I called them gentleman parties I organized them in Berlin every nice. two weeks so we had three parties each day And yeah, it was highly profitable. But for me, I didn't want to have so much sex anymore because also of STI and other risks. It also sounds like a lot of work. It sounds exhausting. Yes, it's like sport. Uh, for me... Yeah. No, you're sexual athletes. Honestly. Yeah, yeah, I found... Yeah, sexual athletes. And I found out, wow, I, my body is like a tool, you know, uh, a tool uh, which I can make uh, money from. I was very proud of. I was, as a friend from the from New York said, you are sitting on a gold mine. She wrote a <laughs> You're poem. living in a gold mine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but then um, I said, no, uh, I don't want to make any more sex uh, uh, sports. I prefer to have uh, very few and regular clients. And uh, then mm. I met a wonderful woman from the United States, from Montana, And I met her as a party girl in London. And she invited me to a friend's house, a castle in the south of England. And the owner was a German like me, but he never lived in Germany he, uh, all his life. He lived in uh, South America, Brazil, all over the world, in Jordan. He know the king of Jordan. Oh, so wow. he, he, met, wow. he met many prominent people. And yeah, and he loved uh, swinger parties and things like that. And he organized his parties also in this castle. He was a party boy as well yeah and uh, I, did, I did a bit yeah I, w I was joining swinger parties but swinger party is not so my my thing but but it was nice because they are very interesting guests and we had good conversations and also very prominent people I cannot tell the names no <laughs> but on. really nice people <laughs> that, that was at the castle <laughs> yes they all come in to, to the castle and um, yeah and we had a great fun um, And sometimes I also advertised uh, locally and I had some clients a week, not so many. So it was not highly profitable, but most of my time I was writing and I was reading and I was walking in the lovely countryside. 
Yes. So you were living in the castle. Yes. Yeah, so well, whereabouts? Tell us. Where did you see the clients? Where did you sleep? Yeah, I lived in the castle and I had my own room. It was so called uh, the blue room. And uh, we had a jacuzzi. Sometimes I go to the village and uh, made some shopping. And also the shop owner sometimes asked me what I'm doing in the castle. And then they looked at me and they heard about the castle in relation to swinger parties. But I said, I'm the, uh, the niece of uh, the owner. They knew that it just was a German guy. Heidi. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, yes, I'm, um, I'm visiting my uncle. And I'm a writer, I said, I'm a book writer. So, and then they didn't ask again. <laughs> But I had something about you living in some sort of sex tower. Yes, it was a, a, a huge uh, tower. This castle had a very huge tower. It was built in 18th century. And originally this tower was built to have a nice view to the seaside at around 100 um, miles away. But you could see it if with a good view sex and, with a view <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh, but then i called it the sex tower because of the parties and when i uh, of course sex workers who have access to information they used to do some client screening on the phone or by email that you yeah that you only meet up nice guys and the bad ones you push aside you know and then i could if i listen to those guys on the telephone i could decide okay This guy is okay, and I could uh, recognize where this person come from, or if he was very rude and never would invite him to this lovely place, you know. Uh, rude people, I always stay away. So, mm. <laughs> And all of this time, I never experienced violence or something, mm. as I had uh, these experiences in the beginning in the Brussels. Because if you work independently and you have the ability to screen the clients, It's very safe, really. I think it was the best time of my life, I would Aww. say. Oh, yes. that sounds really good. And yeah. I enjoy sexuality very much. So after sex parties in, in Berlin, I usually went to swinger clubs and had also <laughs> some fun in yeah. the swinger club. So I had a, go a good fuck in the daytime, you know, with 12 guys or something. And in the <laughs> evening, I was not tired. I got, uh, went to the swinger <laughs> club as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm interested to know. You enjoy the work. Enjoy. Yes, I enjoyed it. Yeah. So yeah. it wasn't just money. You were also getting yes. stuff out of it, right? Yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, because if you enjoy this work, uh, the, the clients, they feel it, of course. And then mm. you have some regulars and they come again. And if you have no regulars, uh, you cannot survive in critical times. For example, during COVID, I mm. know from many escorts that they could only survive because they have many regulars. And these regulars are usually people from a middle class background and have families. So they are also very careful and take care of their health and safety and everything. So mm -hmm. Yeah, I heard cases uh, from Madrid in Spain where there was a really, really severe lockdown. So you weren't even uh, allowed to take a walk. And so kind of family fathers, they took the shopping bag so that they could explain to the police that they're on their way shopping to the supermarket and they, they visited their sex worker basically <laughs> getting around the rules yeah but there are highly uh, critical situations for many sex workers in germany because of covid because the brussels had to close down during yeah. covid and the people lost their workplaces and then they moved indoor <laughs> in other structures, uh, other flats, sharing flats with others, or sometimes they work isolated in flats. And if you work isolated, you have not so much uh, security. Hmm. And then violence uh, happened more often, or also uh, sex trafficking happened also. In many cities, uh, the police registered everything. And so that was really uh, horrible because now we have legalized structures in Germany with uh, also registered Brussels, for example. And then we have also an informal industry that mostly developed during COVID. And um, this is uh, also a big problem, actually. I think it was also during COVID when you started writing. Do you want to tell us a bit more about that? Oh, I started writing um, when I was young, but I was also writing more than 400 columns for a sex magazine at uh, Kaufmith. This is a German um, sex work network and they have uh, own magazine and I wrote over 10 years, 400 columns. And also I was blogging a lot. And then during COVID, I had more time. And after work, I started writing um, 
a book and then the next one. So now I have written two books and I start the third book. So I think one of the books is also available in English. Maybe you want to tell us about that one. It's a new novel, right? The first book uh, was a non-fiction book about sex work and how we prevent sex trafficking, or I call it forced prostitution. And I find ways, mostly because I was working for a long time in the IT industry and the tech industry, and I found solutions. How we can we prevent people, also minors, to stay away from adult platforms? And that's the reason why I was writing about this book. And it's also now published in English. And the second book is a novel. It's a kind of auto-fictional novel, but it's also a memoir. Yeah. So it's a kind of autobiography <laughs> at the end. But I pretend to be it's a novel. <laughs> and what's the name? It's called, in English, it's called Bread. And what's the yeah, name? it's a slang word for money. And in German, uh, it's a slang word for money. It's Kohle. So all the stories in this mm. book and this novel are about money in a way. So it's also kind of, it's a novel, it's fiction, but it leans on your life. Yes, it's true. So why don't you tell people where they can find the book if they want to get a copy? The English copy you can, uh, it's available on lulu.com. Lulu.com is uh, based in the United States. It's a self-publishing uh, house and it's also available as an ebook. Nice. So I hope I uh, I find many readers <laughs> because it's um, it's breaking taboos in many ways, um, family taboos, the taboo of violence, the taboo of sexuality, uh, so many taboos, and uh, yeah, and um, myself, I'm a person or a woman who was always an independent thinker with a very different lifestyle, I would say. <laughs> um, I think so, yeah. To and most. Um, yeah, and it's about this um, this book. Amazing. It's, so that is Brad by Matira Peng, available on lulu.com. Matira Peng, thank you so much for being our guest. It was a really nice interview. Yeah, I was really enjoyed talking to you. Oh, thank you so much, guys, that you invited me to come today and, yeah, and tell a bit about my life because I have no children. I cannot tell them <laughs> what I experienced. Well, it will be immortalized now in podcast form and book form. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. And I want to say you have a really one of the best podcasts I ever uh, experienced in the last years. And I know many podcasts also about uh, failure sexuality and other stuff. So, um, But I think your podcast is really kind of progressive, I would say. And, oh, thank, oh, thank, you, thank you so much. You. <laughs> that's, that's what we strive for. Thank you. Uh So that was Matira. I Anna. loved talking to her. She's such a babe. Yeah, you know, kind of, um, she actually lives in Germany. And as you know, Anna and I, we live in Barcelona. And um, we have this company retreat thing. We might tell you about this another time. And Matira came for this. So we really got to know her. And I kind of I really, I love her so much. She's like um, a cat. She's lived nine lives. Every time I walked past her, she was like, I was doing that. I was nearly a famous actress. I was a novelist. I was an academic. And I was like, you are... Yeah, you're living so many lives and I'm just living the one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she, she is a rock star life, I would call it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I hope that conversation filmed you with lots of nourishment and academic thought because she's super intelligent and that it will embolden you to support sex workers' rights and get out there and campaign and at least sign some petitions to get governments to loosen rules and make it safer for sex workers to operate. Should we tell people about next episode? Next episode, The Life of a Human Ashtray comes to film. Oh my God, that would be a really interesting one because it was not only you, also Anna and I, we noticed that we love to talk to women and we love to talk to really strong, powerful women. But we, now we want to also give some space to submissives. And uh, on next episode's interview, we have um, I Am Black Sheep as a guest. Yes, yeah, so I Am Black Sheep is actually a moderator for our website, fetish.com. And he is a film sub or slave, does a lot of BDSM porn, and he actually has his own production company, I think. And we'll just be talking to him all about being a male submissive on camera and all his favorite kinks and how he got into this lifestyle.
So without further ado, let's say goodbye for now and we'll see you next episode. Yeah, see you next episode. Keep it kinky. Don't forget to subscribe to Spanky Next on Spotify, Apple or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow us on Instagram at Spanky Next Podcast. If you'd like to connect with people who share your kinks, sign up to fetish.com for free or download the FET app from Google Play Store and the App Store now. And for any one of you who is looking to deepen their knowledge of kink, head to the BDSM training school on fetish.com and enroll in a course now. And last but not least, shout out to our producer Billy Cragen, our kinky team and everyone who makes this podcast possible. Oh.